fought for today. And um, today continues on the module we started in our previous course, um, in previous session. Um, so we're talking about networks as a key element in HMAS models capturing context. Uh, and uh, within uh, the last the last session, we had talked at a basic level about um, some of the um, motivations for and importance of networks uh, in agent based modeling and in understanding complex systems in the world, the compelling roles that they play, um, and some of the varieties that that occur um, that that you'll find in the world. Uh, of, of different types of networks, weighted networks, bipartite networks, uh, networks where you have unidirectional connections only from, from A to B is different from B to A, or, or, or excuse me, directed connections versus unidirectional where there's no difference in direction maintained. Um, uh, there are networks uh, of, of a diversity of structures which have been described in the literature which are routinely used and have a role to play in agent-based modeling. Um, but uh, today we're going to be going through and looking at some of the most popular classes in terms of the mathematical structure of these networks and examining their structural implications as well as their dynamic implications. Um, so uh, when I stood before, uh, before you here uh, during our last session, I talked about motivations for representing networks and um, I included discussion of, of all of those on the slide. And I noted many of these come from the broader uh, question of when do we represent features of the world within our models? Um, we do so to capture dynamics uh, that are seen as, as particularly important to our needs. Um, uh, but there's many other motivations, for example, to, to represent, to be able to capture the the effects of the interventions we want to characterize, uh, to want to understand the differential impact of our of our actions across different members of the population, so important in the context of of health disparities and equity issues, for example, um, we do so to capture the fact that uh, we represent networks to capture the fact that people often have localized perception of a situation. And they may not be motivated to, for example, get vaccinated until someone um, nearby them in their network has caught COVID-19. Um, and representing disparities in access to resources, perhaps um, uh, knowledge of the healthcare system or, or um, reliable understanding about health risks uh, associated with certain behavioral patterns, et cetera. Um, there's many motivations for representing networks today we're going to be talking about network structure and network dynamics. So our, we're gonna kind of zoom in on this capturing dynamics. And we're gonna see that different network structures induce different structures at runtime. That is different uh, dynamics um, come from it. And it's not merely a matter of speed of spread. Um, it's also a question of whether it goes extinct or not. It's a question of um, how, uh, to what degree, is there uh, sort of bursts of, of infection or to what degree is there kind of a slow buildup? Um, to what degree does heterogeneity in the network, for example, clustering of vulnerable individuals play a role in, in causing outbreaks where they might not be expected? And, and as we'll see, uh, dynamics can be qualitatively different based on network structure. But you know, in a point to which I'll come back at the end of today's lecture, um, we need to remember that the things we're going to be looking at today are not the only consideration that motivates inclusion of networks in our models. And often it's this desire to capture the effects of interventions, um, uh, the effects of interventions, or the mechanisms of interventions that are just on uh, just as important. So today we're going to go back and forth between slides on the one hand and, and uh, example models will be running on the other. And to that end, I'd ask you to fire up uh, any logic and we're going to go to the course site 
and download one of the models um, that I placed there. Uh, placed it there just this morning. This model is a uh, is begat by uh, a model I had there previously, but it's a new version uh, just for you. And uh, I, I, I placed it there this morning. Um, so be sure to, to go and get it. Um, so if you go up to the course site, there should be one called SIR model ABM and SD for alternative networks version <clears throat> two. Um, and uh, what it lacks in imagination, you'll see it makes up for in functionality, okay? So uh, if you go and you download that and you upload, uh, you uh, load it in to any logic, we'll be using it to explore the dynamic implications and the structural implications of a variety of, of network types. Um, so that will be occupying us throughout this session. So, so let's go. I'll, I'll give you a moment to get it. Um, when you open it up, you should see a model, which if you don't go double click on main, um, you should see something like this. There's a uh, familiar uh, SIR type, SIRS type model. People start susceptible, they become infective, they become recovered and they, uh, they undergo waning of immunity. Um, but we're also see that there'll be an agent population. And up top, we're going to see there's a variety of outputs which characterize the structure of the network. Here, the degree distribution. And um, here we'll, we'll see aspects of network dynamics. So if we go run this network, um, uh, or sorry, go run this, this model, uh, we'll go to uh, the baseline experiment and we'll fire it up and we're, we're running it with a population of a thousand. And what we're going to see is uh, the population down here, um, there's going to be one person initially starting infective and it's spreading out from there. But we're also seeding the same population um, size and initial infective up top. And as it's spreading down here in the network, uh, it's also spreading in this SIRS model right alongside it on the same time scale. And up here um, in the upper left, we will see the dynamics of the agent-based model in terms of the number of infectives people who are infectious in the agent-based model displayed, that's the blue. Um, and we will see uh, a corresponding graph from this aggregate system dynamics model, that's the red. And as was commented on last time, there are some differences uh, there between those. And uh, one of the most notable differences is the phenomenon that you see um, illustrated here. What's going on? Can anyone describe at a qualitative level what's what's gone on in this, given that green is susceptible, gray is recovered, red is infective, what's gone on in this lower, lower graph here? Can anyone interpret that? Say in a word or two, what's happened? Died out. It died out, it died out indeed. And you see the number of infectious people here went to zero. And the number of infective, however, in this model, has it died out in, in this model, the SRERS model? No. Most certainly not. It's about, it's about it, it anticipates there being 51 people infective uh, uh, sort of in this steady state. It's gone to a, a steady state. And we might reasonably ask what's, what's gone on differently here? And maybe to, to see that discussion, I will start it again and I will play it out and maybe I'll, I'll slow it down. But what are some, what are some differences in kind of the, the texture of what's gone on, what's going on here in this model on the one hand down here um, uh, versus um, up here? Can anyone, anyone wanna hazard a guess or, or a comment on that? What's, what are some differences? And maybe someone in the classroom could read out the chat, if you wouldn't mind, if anyone puts something forward. But what are some differences that might induce um, differences between what's going on here, kind of in the 
the nature of the situation, the texture of the situation, the mechanics of it on the lower side here for the agent, the agent network uh, versus up here for this for this random mixing model, whereby infectives any susceptible can mix with any infective here. Um, and the susceptibles have a contact with, uh, with 10 people per month, which could be with anyone from any of these groups, but a certain fraction of them are infective. And for each of those contacts, they have the same transmission probability that this group does down here. So what are some of the, what are some of the differences in kind of the mechanics of it, the, the, the texture of what's going on at the bottom? and in that random mixing model that might induce these observed differences in behavior over time. Can anyone say? What things might lead to the different behavior seen here on the lower side? Anyone? Anyone in the chat? The people are evenly distributed in population in non network members. Good. Good. So, yeah, okay, good. So, in this aggregate model, we have a, infectives and susceptibles have no notion of nearby, who's far. And so they mix together. In, in a sort of random mixing or mass action mixing, whereby any susceptible is equally likely to bump into any infected um, and any recovered or any other susceptible for that matter. So all that matters is, you know, what fraction of people are infected to figure out the risk to a given susceptible. Is that the case down here? If we consider a given susceptible person, like let's say this person here, this, this here person, um, are they equally likely to bump into anyone in this entire space, any one of these infectives? No, who are they more likely to bump into? Who are they more likely to contact? Their neighbors, their neighbors, their neighbors in the network. And the neighbors are, some of them are, are susceptible, some are recovered, but none, I would add, are infective right now. Or take a look at this, this one. Get a load of this one. So this one has connections with a set of recovered people only. They're not connected, whoa, they're not connected with any, any infectives. And there's no chance at any time soon they'll be connected with any infectives because these folks are recovered around them. Um, uh, similarly, this infective, how many people are they going to infect in the near future? This one down here. Anyone? What do you think? What's that? Zero. Because there's nobody they can infect. They're surrounded by this firewall of, of recoveries. Now, in the fullness of time, those recovered individuals, some of them, some may, may become susceptible again. But it's really boxing in these infectives, right? Um, the infection can spread, but how is it spreading? This is kind of another point. So I'm gonna I'm gonna speed this up. Um, and oops, sorry. Um, let's let's try this again. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be running this, but how is it spreading? It's is it spreading jumping all over the network, or is it spreading in a different way? So like, why isn't someone getting infected right now up here? Anyone? Why, why, why isn't someone getting in this next little bit infective right now up here? So there's no infectives near them. There's no infectives near them. Infection is a local process and it spreads locally. And that leads to a very different tempo of spread than we see in the aggregate model where it can spread throughout the, the set of all susceptibles very easily. A given infective can can mix with any susceptible. There's no notion of locality. There's no location of someone nearby. There's no location of a susceptible out of reach, right? There is down here. Um, there's no limit to to how quickly we can 
spread into the set of susceptibles. And, and one sees, therefore, a very different rate of rise in the infectives in the ABM compared to the, in the aggregate mixing model, where it just spikes up. What's another thing that, that's happened here, though, that's very different and ultimately maybe more profound in its long-term implication? What's different between these? Someone said it earlier. One, dies out, the other doesn't. one died out and the other doesn't. Yeah. Simply put, one died out and the other doesn't. Now, uh, why can that happen so readily down here, but not, not up here, uh, not in the aggregate model? Can anyone say why? Why is it that the infection might die out down here? So readily. Yeah, or the, the network provides a second wave for it to die out. Like in the first model, it can only die out if everybody reaching everybody still allows it to. But in this yeah. case, there's an extra, there's a way for it to get blocked from spreading further. Right. In the top model, infection could still die out over time if, if a given infective has so few people anywhere to infect that they're not going to infect more than one person before they, they recover, right? The, basic reproductive number is less than one for whom that's mean for those in the audience for whom that's a meaningful statement. Down here, uh, on the other hand, there's extra constraints, extra structure imposed by this network. Both have structure kind of in terms of the structure of the model, you know, how infection develops and so on. But what we have with networks is another type of structure. It's a sort of uh, topological structure, structure who's connected to whom. And, you know, if it so happens that you have a, a cluster of infectives, but they're not located near any susceptibles, it could readily die out there. And moreover, there's only a very limited number of, of people in this network to whom it can, can spread. Um, we're not talking about a situation where we have such a massive population that it's vanishingly likely that everywhere across it, we have no infection continuing. In other words, if you have a large enough population, you might think, well, look, at any one point, it's quite possible it will go, up, go extinct in a given region, but it would have to go extinct in all regions for it to totally die out. But this is a quite small and quantized population. Moreover, up here, for, for, for this model, infection can actually go arbitrarily low. You could have 0.001 person still infected, but it will still survive in that model. That doesn't happen here. It has a low count of, of one at the beginning and goes as low as something like, I don't know, 20 or, or, or 30 here. But, but it is a difference. This is quantized. We, have a count of the number of people infected, whereas here we have a, it can go an arbitrarily low number, 0 0.001, it will still survive. And it turns out that will make a big difference for certain models. Now, I, I had stood before you here last time and wanted to run a larger population, but there were a couple of things that got in the way. One was the pesky problem of kind of an implementation detail of memory. Another was uh, a performance issue with the model which had to do with it being a hybrid model. And another one was that everyone is crushed into the same space. So um, in putting together today's model, I, I went and, and gave people an appropriate space, tuned up the amount of memory used and put in place, um, uh, put in place a, uh, a better, more performant model. So now we can have a 10,000 person population. And we're going to run this population as the infection spreads here. And you'll notice that in my particular run of it, it's spreading out from here and we can go take a look at it. And uh, I would posit that with a larger population, we might start to see some somewhat longer survival over time um, for how long it remains in the population. It's it's unlikely to die out quite as quick 
um, as it would in the backwater of just a thousand people. Um, so, you know, in, in agent-based modeling, we have these, um, these real uh, issues uh, of locality of spread of a limited number of, of pop people in the population that can limit you know, th uh, some of the effects and can lead to stochastic disappearance. And ultimately it's a stochastic model. And you'll notice here that with this larger population, it kind of scrapes by. It, it goes down almost to zero here and, and then continues on and peters on. And if we wanted to, we could export this data and put it into a spreadsheet and you know see see how low it went. Um, but uh, with that larger population, it it um, has uh, has taken longer to to it, it's continued persisting in the population for longer. So this is this is a model showing a distance based network, and that's one of several types of networks we'll be looking at today. But the general lesson here from this is, uh, should be clear that when we have, you know, a, an agent-based model, we have a quantized model broken up into individuals. If it, if there's no individual infected, after all, the lowest it can go is one and for it to survive. And if it goes to zero, it goes extinct. There are stochastics present uh, that, can lead to chance events happening or not. There are moreover constraints or structure imposed by the network that can really change the dynamics compared to what we see with a stock and flow model, an aggregate model, uh, whereby it can spread from any susceptible to any infective wherever they may be across the population. I should emphasize the parameters of these two models are the same, but I mentioned that last time, but um, the dynamics are very different here. And it turns out these dynamics will differ further yet across different network types. So, so let's, go, let's go check out some other network types with your leave. So I'm going to, again, start screen sharing, but we'll jump back to the slides here. Um, and uh, we're going to go check out in this model, a place where we can characterize the networks that are in place. And, and to, to use that, I'm gonna go up to main here or go down main. Um, uh, I'll, I'll go down main and uh, scroll down and we'll see in the, uh, in the space and network area, you may have to expand it with this expando um, sort of uh, uh, dialogue or, or area of the, uh, the properties. I'm in the properties window here. If you don't see it, you go view properties. And you'll see the network type right now is set to be distance space. We will engage in fruitful Robbing of that uh, choice here. So we're going to go through a bunch of these types of networks, Poisson random networks, ring lattice networks, small world networks, scale-free networks. Not because they are the privileged ones shown in any logic, but it's, it's a fact, the fact that they are in any logic reflects their importance um, uh, in understanding common features in the world and understanding kind of simpler, simple exemplar cases uh, for networks, um, kind of stylized networks from which we can learn. So we're gonna be changing that network type in space and network area of Maine here, okay? Okay, um, so uh, we're going to um, here go through a set of, of network types and the ordering here is uh, a little bit, a um, little bit. I wouldn't say it's arbitrary. It's it's done with certain principles in mind, but there's some tensions involved in it. And uh, specifically, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's uh, tensions having to do with the fact that I'd like to come back to certain themes. So we're going to be tracing an evolution between network types, which broadly goes from 
very localized networks, network where you have very local structure, where you're really constrained what you can spread to. So if you're a given, if a given node is infective, there's a lot of constraints about to what other nodes that node is connected and therefore to what to which they can influence through the network. That's and we're going to go to some that are more and more global, less and less constrained, less and less structured in many ways. So that's one of the sort of arcs of this discussion for the balance of this session. But another arc um, for it has to do with kind of some networks being composites of other networks. So it turns out, for example, small world networks, uh, we're going to be exploring this kind of simplest form of those. And small world networks are um, a, a composite in some ways of a very local network. One of the, arguably the most local network you can have a ring lattice network, the very first we'll explore. And the far extreme, a totally, totally random network, but what's called an Erdos random network or Poisson random network or Bernoulli network or simply a random network where any two nodes are equally likely to be connected um, as any other two nodes uh, with the same probability. There's no notion of locality. There's no, lo there's no location of two nodes being close together and therefore more likely to be connected like there is with the local networks. And in fact, um, as, as plays a role in, in some other network types. So um, here we're going to be exploring with that broad local to, to global, and we're gonna take a specific focus uh, on scale-free networks um, because scale-free networks are ubiquitous. They, um, they have profound impacts on uh, the dynamics of spread of contagion over networks, whether it's pathogen or knowledge, ideas, uh, innovations, attitudes, beliefs, um, uh, they're, they're key quantities. And because they arise in all sorts of cases, both in health areas, but in many other domains as well. The structure of the internet, for example, um, software uh, engineering, they, they arise there as well. So we're gonna go uh, look at scale-free networks with a little bit more attention, both their statistical properties and their dynamic properties. So with those comments, I'd like to dive in here, if I may. Um, so uh, I'm going to share my screen again, and we will go to take a look at some local networks first. And the first one we're going to look at is going to be the ring lattice network. Now, to do this most effectively, I'm going to actually change the layout of the network. I'm going to actually arrange it in a ring. And I'll show you why in just a moment. But let's, let's go up to our any logic, which is kind of the tool we're going to happen to use for this. And, and I'm going to change it from a distance-based network to a ring lattice network. And notice that I'm, I'm not changing the layout setting yet. So what we're going to see is the most uh, what's structurally going to be a ring, but it's not going to be obvious because things are going to be sort of shown in, 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 a, in a disorganized fashion, sort of all over the place, just splatted down at random connections. So if I go run this, we'll see people here just connected, you know, at random with, with other people. Um, in this in this thousand person network, if I viewed it with a hundred person network, I'm gonna I'm gonna make use of a somewhat smaller network to teach these principles. Um, we would we would see also that people are just kind of kind of located connected every which way. If there's no obvious structure there, but we have to visualize it in the right way to elicit that structure. So back to Maine. And while it's not of conceptual significance, we're going to change the layout type. We're just gonna draw them in different places to bring out the network structure. So we have a ring lattice. That was with a ring lattice. Everyone was connected with exactly a certain number of connections to their left and to their right on a ring, but we couldn't see it. So let's go to a ring, a random network. 
uh, sorry, go to layout type and let's go to ring. We're gonna, we're gonna display them, ladies and gentlemen, in a ring. Maybe we will go back to the to the thousand here, okay? For baseline, let's let's go let's go uh, live on the edge. Um, I was going to do it with a hundred, but um, uh, sometimes there's benefits from a bit of innovation. Okay, so now we see people in a ring. So this is a this is not Larry Niven's Ring World. It's a band which um, which looks continuous, but there's actually individuals within the band. They're just so packed tightly tightly packed that you can't distinguish them except when they're a different color. Um, so all around here are a thousand people spread out in this ring. And we seated one of them at the beginning up here. Now each of these thousand people is connected with exactly 10 other people. Five to the left, five to the right. Okay, um, so they are connected with the nearest nearby people, the nearest people on the left and nearest people on the right. Um, and uh, they're spread the, and the infection is seated there. And maybe you could tell me what's going on in this infection. Can anyone tell me what's, what's happening here? Like what general feature, what general structure do you see in how the network, how the infection is spreading? Anyone? Spread around the ring. Now, it doesn't seem to be spreading at the moment. And why is that? What's going on here? Remember, uh, green is susceptible, red is infective, gray is recovered. What's going on? What happened? It died out. Let's let's run that again. Maybe that was just a, a fluke or something, but let's let's try it. So wait, did you have something to, no, to say? Sorry? I, I didn't. Okay. So here someone started infected, but but it died out. Let's let's try it again. Here we here we go. Um uh a thousand people. Okay, it's spreading out, spreading out. And notice it's it's spreading around the ring. Why is it only spreading around the ring? Can anyone say? Why 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 does it only spread around the ring? Why isn't it leaping? Yes. Or no there's no connections. People are only connected to their left and their right around this ring. And we sort of link it up, you know, at the end for for simplicity, for sort of uh, closed boundary conditions, but uh, but it's spreading. Now, what happened here? It also stopped. Why did it stop? Why did it stop that first time? Why did it stop this time? Why does it pretty much stop every almost every time? Stochastically, what's what's going on? Okay, it's spreading for a while. And then what tends to happen after a while by luck of the draw? Anyone? So it's still spreading, but then it stops. Why? Anyone? Why is it spreading? Or why isn't it spreading anymore? Because what happened by uh, chance? Yeah. Sorry? Maybe uh, maybe connected we recovered people or uh, dying off. Yeah, yeah. So if at some point, remember, I'm connected. If I'm an infective, I'm connected with five people to my right, five people to my left. So maybe I'm I'm this one up here, and right? I'm standing five to my left, five to my right. Right? I'm infected. Um, I'm only going to be able to infect those five people to my left. So if if all those people kind of upstream or sort of downstream of me, where it's spreading, if those five people have already recovered, I'm going to have not a chance of spreading to them anytime soon, right? Moreover, there is some chance that I'll I'll just keep on, you know, um, misfiring and and not even though one of them is susceptible, I just won't happen to infect them before I recover, and it will stop by by chance. There are these there can be firewalls or or chance encounters that lead to inability to propagate and there are barriers created because of this local structure this local structure let's go scroll up and and remember that we have up here a histogram i showed you this last time uh 
but it's a histogram which shows um, for people, and so on the x-axis is different possible connection counts for people. And the y-axis shows what fraction of people, a percent of people um, uh, have in percentage terms, have that many connections. What does this graph show now? It's a kind of singularly monolithic graph, but what does it show now? This is kind of an awkward way to show it, but what is it? How many people, how many connections do people have total? How much variability is there in connection, the number of connections people have? No variability. Everyone has exactly how many connections? 10. 10. And it, it kind of awkwardly shows it between 10.01 and 10.9, but you know, you always have to divide things up in a histogram anyway. 100% of people lie with 10 connections, five to their left, five to their right, right? Okay, um, this is the most extraordinarily localized network you can imagine, right? Um, it's, it's in 1D, there's one degree of freedom. You can go, you can go along this line and if it's blocked, the infection will not propagate. And because of stochastics, it can become blocked. And it's largely a matter of when does it become blocked? You know, how quickly does it become blocked? If you, if you run this again and again, sometimes it has a long run before it gets blocked. Sometimes it gets blocked just about immediately. It gets plugged up, right? It, it can't go anywhere. Local connections can lead to these blockages. They can lead to these, you know, inability for it to propagate. Big impact, and it leads, you know, dynamically up here to a profoundly different situation. So one thing is it goes extinct, like we saw before. But a second thing is it really doesn't speed up its spread. Why isn't it speeding up its spread? Why isn't it accelerating? After all, this, this red line accelerated upwards. You can't really see it, but it started spreading small and then it got steeper and steeper and then it kind of came down and became more gradual. Why isn't the blue line, why isn't this one also starting slower but then accelerating upwards? Yeah, Eric. Since it's only the one dimension, there's no possibility for exponential growth. There's no possibility of exponential growth, right? There's no situation where, you know, each new infective breeds more infections yet and, and it sort of compounds and you get this, you get this, kind of vicious cycle where infection spreads faster and faster and faster, it snowballs, right? With more and more people getting infected and more and more infections happening, which causes that classic exponential rise you see in the first wave for a um, for infectious disease model. You see it here, right? Um, where, you, where you see it picking up here. You see the same pattern with fads or with spread of ideas, et cetera, spread of conspiracy theories. Um, so here we don't see that. What we see is kind of it peters along kind of in a piddling sort of way at the same basic speed. It's just kind of pressing outwards at the same speed because really it's only the very people at the very edge that can spread it, right? There may be a zillion people internally who are infected, but really they they can't spread it to anyone, right? Like like all these people, and, and I, I wanna get a long run of these um, so I could show it. Um, it's only these people at the edges that can possibly spread it. The people internally can barely spread to anyone, if anyone at all, right? Because everyone around them has been infected or has recovered now. Um, okay, the most local sort of network, ring lattice network. And we arranged it in a ring, but Really, that wasn't the essence of it. The essence of it was people were connected in a ring. This course will soon be discussing spatial structure, but here we see a situation where we've laid it out to sort of illustrate the, the, the topology, who's connected with whom. Um, and, uh, and we've chosen a convenient way of, looking, uh, of laying it out. Um, uh, you could think of it as the spatial layout 
then determines who they're connected to if you want to. And this will become a dominant theme within the next type of network. So kind of back to the slides here, ladies and gentlemen, back as it were to the salt mines. Um, okay, so um, we're going to be um, using this layout type some more to kind of conveniently lay things out and, to, and for this network, next network type, we're going to be showing a 2D localized network. With ring lattice, it's 1D, one dimension, right? It's along a line. Now we're going to explore 2D, which often is reflective of kind of if we project geographic space into an area using UTM, you know, we have northings and westings or what have you in a network. Um, and we're going to connect two people if they lie within a certain distance of each other. So here, we're going to be caring about location of people. So we're gonna put a layout type now for random. We're gonna splay them out across the space and we're gonna connect them together in a distance-based way, okay? Um, in this distance-based way. Um, and we will do so with a distance of, and I'm doing this from memory, we had it at the beginning, I think it was around 27 if memory serves me, but I, I, I would have to go back and double check. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just try running this and here we go, yeah. Um, that is the ring of, of accuracy on it. Um, three cubed uh, for those who are number files. Um, okay. Um, so here, we're going to start the infection. We saw this earlier, so I'm going to go a bit lighter in describing it. We started with a given infective. And this, too, is spreading locally, right? In the ring lattice, we only one sort of dimension along which we could spread. We could spread to the left or spread to the right. And it was spreading along both until it got plugged up. Here, we have more degrees of freedom. We have two degrees of freedom. We can spread you know, to the left and, and or right, and we can spread up and down, right? Um, and, and spread we are, but we, we have to be, we're constrained to spread only along the network. And these constraints are key, just as they were in the ring lattice. The fact that we can only spread locally, we can't jump way across the network, we can't leap way to the separate corner, it's going to make all the difference in, in what we observe. It spreads, but it spreads much more slowly than what we see in the, in the aggregate network. There, we get this snowballing effect of which Eric spoke. You know, infectives breed new infections, which breed infectives. And you get this piling on that leads to exponential growth in infectives. Here, we don't see that. We, we do see a sort of you know, pulse upward some, but it's not fully exponential uh, in the same way because of these spatial constraints. Um, as it spreads, it can, it can spread outwards with a certain speed, but by and large, it's not going to spread, uh, spread in, a, in an exponential fashion. We can have kind of local outbreaks, but over time for a smaller population, it tends to go extinct. Um, so we have this constrained spread again. It's less constrained. It's spreading in 2D space, um, but ultimately we have these, these same bottlenecks can, that can develop. They have to be bigger bottlenecks to sort of fully um, you know, uh, limit us, uh, limit the infection from spreading. Hence the, the notion of like a cordon sanitaire, a surrounding area around, uh, you know, Wuhan, the city of Wuhan to prevent it from spreading, for example. It has to surround it in 2D space, right? Um, so uh, these 2D networks um, still whisper of the, basic constraints that we saw in that ring lattice network. They have more flexibility, more freedom, but we can still be boxed in and we tend still tend to go to to go extinct with small populations. 
Now, as we saw earlier, if we have larger populations, we can have survival of this network um, or of the infection spread over a, a period of time. Um, it, it's not, not as statistically doomed to going extinct uh, as it is in a ring lattice network. Um, there is a good chance that pockets will remain uh, remain uh, available for infection in a much much larger population. That certain areas will start to recover, will start to wane immunity, and are then subject to infection and time to keep it going, etc. Um, but it is something which can still go extinct even in a larger network, and it has close calls. Um, it does lead to very different dynamics, and at the cost of you know taking a, a minute or two to initialize this network, uh, I will just remind you of it. When we saw it kind of petering along here, um, even though it didn't go extinct, uh, it it did survive. Let's wait for it to impose the network. We actually saw that it didn't explode like it does in the random mixing network. In the random mixing network, where you get this snowballing effect, one infective breeds two, breeds four, breeds eight, breeds 10. You know, if each can infect two, it just grows like gangbusters. Um, if each can infect, can infect 10 before they recover, it goes from, you know, one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 um, in this random mixing network. By contrast, in this network uh, involving, you know, this 2D spatial spread, what we see is is a um, is a spread that's more localized. Um, it grows, so you can grow to larger and larger radii where there's more and more people in them. The further out it goes, um, but even as it survives uh, for for a while. It tends to do so at a much different tempo, a much different sort of uh, rate of of spread. So I'm going to to let this run here, and and we'll we'll see uh, as it runs uh, how it plays out for for this localized ABM. While it's doing that, I'm just going to draw your attention to the degree distribution graph. We saw for the case of the of the simple network earlier, um, the ring lattice, that everyone had exactly 10 connections. What do we see here? How many connections do people have? What's the single most um, single most popular number of connections for people to have here? Can anyone say? Yeah, it's it's like, whoa, okay. Um, looks like I need more memory for this thing. Um, uh, but uh, it's something like nine or 10 there. That's exactly right. Um, uh, it was that highest bar there. Um, was everyone at 10 like it was for the ring lattice? No, no, there was some variability. Some people had very, very few connections. Some people had a great many. Um, well, or at least, you know, a fair, fair number of, of beyond the others, maybe three times the number or something like that. Um, why do we see that variability? Who are those people with very, very few connections? Who might these be? If, if we think about this network uh, down below, who might these people be who are very few connections? Anyone? Located far away from yeah, people are located far away, kind of the outliers, the periphery, right? Uh, you know, so someone like this, for example, who might be in a in a in a distant position, or someone like this, people who are spatially and thereby, this is a distance-based network, topologically, have um, you know distant from others, right? Um, who are the people? who tend to be uh, really well connected, lots and lots of connections, like 20 or, or above. Who are these folks? Who do they tend to be? Well, 
they're in this sort of dense thicket like of connections, right? Here, 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 we might expect some people to have lots and lots of connections. These network cores where people are tightly connected. This is a concept we'll come back to with scale-free networks in a minute. Okay. Um, so uh, in, those, in those network cores, we might see people having a lot more connections per person. Okay. And, but most people are in this range of kind of two to 20, something like that. And, and with a very large fraction being from something like six to 18 within that range of sort of three times. Now, um, if I compare the number of connections for a given person with the number of connections for their friends, you'll notice the number of connections for their friends tends to be somewhat higher. Why, why is that? Why is it that if we summarize connections over each person in the population versus um, overall their, their friends, you know, counting someone as multiple people's friends several times, why is it that they'll be, tend to be a, a larger number? The distribution will be slightly shifted to the right for the friends. Why is that? Anyone? Why would that be that if we look at the, the number of connections that people in the population have overall versus the degree distribution for their connections, it will tend to be higher among the connections. Amongst other things, who's left out of the connections? Who, who, so in other words, the friends don't include by definition anyone who what? Is not connected to anyone else, right? And people tend to be connected um, to, to those who, who have connections. And, and uh, we're going to see that this difference will be much larger yet for scale-free networks because the people with whom most people have few connections, but there's going to be some people with lots and lots of connections, including to some of those people who have few. So in general, the people to whom we're connected tend to be the sort of people that have connections. And here it's not a huge difference, but for a scale-free network, it will be. Uh, it can be quite a, a distinction. Um, but if we go back and we look at the dynamics of this network, um, we'll notice that this network, like its like its one D counterpart, its ring lattice network, you know, it does spread, but it tends not to spread in a way that is um, explosive. It tends not to spread in a way that breeds exponential growth for sustained periods. It sort of it 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 goes on in a way that that you know, will spread, but in a kind of way that grows linearly, sort of as you could think of the number of people that are in the outer ring of a circle as it grows, that are in the outer part of that circle. You know, you get a bigger and bigger number in that circle as the circle grows, the radius grows, goes up kind of linearly, and then maybe it dies down as you as that outbreak sort of tends to peter out, but some survive and it grows kind of linearly. But you just don't see this kind of, this exponential growth that you see here because of so much constraints of space. Yes, a uh, straight uh, space in the network. Yes, Eric. If we were to squish down the size of this network with the same number of people, as yes. we get smaller, would that eventually approximate the, the, the aggregate? Yes, it would. Yes, it, it will see that. Great, great question. So Eric's question was a, a very insightful one. And, and what he asked is, look, I mean, um, uh, if we were to take the same network and we were to smush it down so that this set of people become a small ball, uh, like the ball of bees in a beehive in the winter, right? Uh, and and they're, they're really tightly packed with basically everyone connected with everyone else. Would we see something similar to what we do for an aggregate network? And the answer is absolutely. And we're gonna be coming to that, okay? Um, so, so we will, but... Um, 
This is a distance-based connection network. Things spread locally, um, less, less constrained than a 1D network, but still a lot of constraints. You get these very localized outbreaks and constraints on it spreading by the presence of these firewalls of these already recovered people or, or others you know, who, are, who are infected um, that, that limit kind of the surface area over which it can spread. Okay, so um, let's, let's go now. And I am going to uh, go on to uh, another network type. I will say that these networks, these distant phase networks can be discontinuous. They can be divided into disk disjoint components. And there's a formal term, the component of the network. Um, so, you know, you can not get these islands basically of people. Um, in these networks, something along these lines, where um, you know infection can't get from here to here, you can't get to there from here, sort of idea. Um, uh, okay, now this last network um, had some notable variety in its degree distribution. In other words, if we looked at people in the in the population and we considered to how many other people they're connected, there was considerable variety. Most people, it was kind of within six to 18 people to whom they're connected, but you know, some had two, even maybe even there was one or something and, and some had in the twenties. Um, so, you know, it, it bears to discuss some um, heterogeneity. There's heterogeneity here, not just in where someone happens to be located, but real heterogeneity and to whom they're connected. And we're gonna see a, we've seen a network where there's some heterogeneity, but what we're going to is a network type, scale-free networks, where there's profound heterogeneity. Now, I want you to reflect on the fact that when it comes to heterogeneity, someone who has a high number of partners in an infection spread network, say, but the same ideas hold for spread of ideas or spread of memes or conspiracy theories or rumors or innovations, et cetera. Someone with a high number of partners is both more likely to be infected by a partner, right? They have large numbers of connections. And so if any one of those connections is infective, that person who's connected to them can become infective. So they're more vulnerable to infection. They're like an infection magnet. But at the same time, if they are infected, they're more likely to pass it on to another person, another agent. So they have this disproportionate influence in, in spreading infection, which has led to great focus on, on these individuals within public health. But they also serve as conduits of infection because they can pick it up easily from all sorts of places in the, in the population, and then they can spread it to other people. Um, and uh, if we have situations where we can distinguish people who are high contact from low contact, often you could see really different infection rates. And, and in some cases, you could see in, in, in some notable cases, you could see infections that will survive in high contact rate individuals that would die out in the broader population. If you consider the average number of contacts someone in the population has, it'll be such the infection would never survive. The basic reproductive number or the effective reproductive number right now would be less than one. But for high contact individuals, they may have effective reproductive numbers. They may in fact well more than one person before they recover because they see so many. And you know, people with large numbers of connections have achieved uh, a status of great, great significance within public health. Uh, targeted interventions that reach them might be able to achieve you know, great bang for the buck. So you think about individuals, for example, who, are, who um, have caught HIV through drug, you know, through, through drug use, intravenous drug use, and maybe through needle sharing with others. Those individuals who might share needles with a dozen people in the context of a, of a month might spread it to many, many other people, whereas others 
you know, uh, who may have HIV AIDS, they, they may only contact one or two people at a level that would risk infection per month. And so a lot of public health efforts have focused on these, these core groups, these groups with large numbers of connections, often in the center of networks. Could be intravenous drug users, could be high-risk sexual, uh, sexually uh, uh, circulating individuals, uh, could be individuals who circulate broadly um, with respect to uh, respiratory infections, maybe they're traveling salesmen and they go to a lot of different places, et cetera. And we're going to take a look at this issue of heterogeneity in more, in more detail here. Um, and, you know, study of empirical populations have found uh, great variability in, in across many areas of human behavior. And one of them is sexual partnerships. So there are, uh, there are a real, there's a real variety of different levels of sexual activity within partner, within populations. Most people uh, within the population, if you look at the relative frequency, this is on a log graph. So the, you know, the top one, uh, top value of this is 10 times as more many people represented as this, which is 10 times as many than that. Most people in the population tend to have a limited number of sexual partners per year, for example, one, two, or three, for example, but, um, and, and some with zero, but you will find uh, that there are some individuals in the population who will have dozens of people per year or, or, or hundreds in, in some cases. People have found in studies of, you know, uh, ethnographically of populations circulating at high risk of, of sexually transmitted infections or HIV AIDS. And there's a type of network structure that exhibits this sort of, um, uh, this sort of structure. I'll, I'll notice, I'll note here that not only the y-axis, but the x-axis is a log axis. In other words, you go from one over here to 10 here to 100 here. Each kind of unit along here visually multiplies by 10. Um, you know, it's, it's multiplicative. And so these, these individuals have, you know, dozens of, of sexual partners per, per year, whereas this has um, just very few. So in a scale-free network, um, we have this sort of pattern emerge. And I'd like to dive into this. Scale-free networks are kind of the poster child for capturing extreme heterogeneity in networks. But, but they're more than that. They're a type of structure which comes very naturally out of a lot of generative processes. And I'd like to, to talk about them. So we're gonna go to our any logic and we're gonna impose a scale-free network, okay? So we're gonna go to population uh, 10, or, sorry, go to main, go down main again to space and networks. And we're going to impose a scale-free network with a connection range of five here. Um, excuse me. Now, this is kind of weird. I don't know why it says connection range. I think it is it is the confused. Okay, I'm gonna say five here. That's that's kind of odd here that it's saying connection range because it should actually be uh, a different label. It should be M that it labels it by. That's um, a little bit odd. Um, I'm hoping it won't cause problems here. Um, I'm going to close this and open it again, just just to uh, not tempt fate. And I'm going to go down to space and networks, scale free, and it's it says M now. Okay, well I'll be. Maybe it, my memory is getting kind of short. Okay, so this is a M of five, and and it turns out that will mean try an average number of connections per person of ten. And we're trying to keep all of these networks we're examining with the same average number of connections. That first one, 27, it should have been 28, it looks like, but basically it's gonna be about 10. Okay, let's, um, let's go uh, and explore these uh, networks a little bit more. So um, uh, having done that, we're gonna be running some, maybe we'll run it right now, since you're in any logic, uh, We'll go run it. So we change it to a scale-free network. This is going to apply for any experiment, and I'm going to run it here with the baseline with a thousand people here. Okay, 
Um, and it'll take a minute to, to wire it up here. Um, and uh, we'll start with just one person infected, but you could see it starts to, to spread out of, across the population. And if you go look up here at the, the contact network, excuse me, the, the connect, excuse me, the uh, connection count distribution histogram up here, you'll notice that um, we have some important distinctions from what we saw before. So this is the population connection count here. So if we look at the population connection count, what features do you see differently from what we saw before? How is this different from the distribution we saw from, let's say, a distance-based network that we were just looking at? There too, we have heterogeneity, but how? why is this different? Can anyone point out one or two ways it's different? All right. Higher variability. Higher variability. Remember there was, you know, a, kind of the edges went from like one or two up to maybe 23, 24. Here we have some going out to above 60. So there's some individuals who have a huge number of connections, you know, above 60 connections. But most individuals have how many? Where, what's the single most highly represented range? Roughly. The bottom one, like the, five, ten yeah, so it's down down here. Yeah, exactly. Um, and you know, if you wanted to to copy it, you could probably get it to report exactly what that is. This is twenty. Um, my guess is this might be um, you know zero to to ten here, um, ten to twenty or something like that. Maybe it's zero to eight. But in any case, most people have few connections. After all, for, for that one, you may remember for a, 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 um, a distance-based network, the single most common one was around nine-ish or something. Yeah. And here it's maybe you know zero to eight, something like that. So most people have small connections, but some people have lots and lots of connections. And again, if you want to see what the actual bins are, you could, you could go put it into a spreadsheet. Um, Secondly, if you look at the friends connections, how does the friends compare with the, the population? Here's the population as a whole, the green, and here's, here's the blue. How does the, how does the blue compare to the green? How does, if we look at the distribution for connections, how does that compare with the population as a whole? With connections, you have what? much longer tail yeah it goes out to it's a i won't say a tall tail it's a heavy tail um so it goes out to a hundred um or so um it's it tends to be heavier further out and this is a reflection of the fact that you know i may have just five connections but i'm connected with someone who might have 50 or might have 80 and the, these people out here you know, with honor, they're connected with a lot of other people. So they're overrepresented. If we if we look at friends of a given person, some of them are going to be these people with, you know, 80 connections, 100 connections, very highly represented there. Keep on showing up again and again and again as, as friends of people, right? Okay, so let's run this thing. Let's observe its dynamics, if we may. Here we go. It's, um, uh, so we're, we're comparing the, this is the SIR model, the, the aggregate SIR model, the, the random mixing model, in other words. And here's the scale-free model. What do we see in the scale-free model that was different than from what we saw with the kind of ring lattice and what we saw with the, um, with the uh, distance, uh, the 2D local connections? What's different here, anyone? We have an initial spike um, in the number of infections. Yeah, there's this really sharp spike in the number of infections. And this is one of the features of scale-free networks that you know, once you hit one of these highly connected individuals, once you hit one of these people out you know, in 100 or 80, like if they get infected, 
boom, it, it disseminates really quickly. And guess who they're likely to be connected with? Other people with lots and lots of connections. Probably at least one of their 80 connections is with another person with 100 or with 60 or whatever. And so it, it tends to kind of um, explode within that within that group and you can see it you know rip out now you might say well compared to a random mixing it's not it it, it uh isn't you know um that much different in the spikiness of it yeah but compared to localized connections compared to 2d um uh and and compared as we'll see even to a small world network it's it's uh, very distinctive. You get this explosion in numbers. And, and that tends to occur uh, in ways in a much larger network um, that might even exceed what you might see with similar parameters in a random mixing network. Um, uh, so it, it explodes. It, um, it then you know, comes down much like a, a random mixing network. And you can see there's kind of some similarity because this is driven by um, recovery there. Uh, and then it sort of, um, you know, propagates along and then it, it dies out because it, it can die out in a population of this size. We don't have time to do it, but I would invite you to, you know, think about running this with a, um, with a larger population. I think it's gonna take a while to compute the connections, so I'm not going to. To do it, compute the network is, is fairly expensive in any logic for reasons that are beyond me. Um, uh, we implemented ourselves instead. Uh, okay, um, so this scale-free structure, um, it tends to lead to some people have tons of connections and some people, most people, to have few. Most people had few here. We saw that in the histogram as well. Most people had few, but some had large numbers of connections. Some have, are these hubs of connections, and but most have comparatively few. Okay, um, why do we see that? Well, it turns out that the, when this happens, um, it happens due to underlying processes that are very common. And therefore, we tend to see it across many different spheres. We can get this sort of power law scaling, the sort of pattern we've just seen statistically from many different sources. And, and a key source is, is the dimensional structure of the situation. I, I won't comment on that more here. We might talk about it later in the, in the course, but it turns out that power law scaling emerges from certain constraints uh, imposed sometimes by uh, by, by the dimensional structure of, of the underlying system. But often it's produced by preferential attachment um, as a sort of notable process. And the idea here is that um, there's a perverse version of the golden rule. Um, uh, the perverse version uh, says, those who have the gold set the rules. Um, those who have the gold therefore benefit from the rules and in the end. Um, and preferential attachment is this process by which a new link tends to be added to those who already have links. That those with links are disproportionately likely to get a new link. Those that are very well connected are more likely to, to meet a new person with new opportunities for, for, for um, you know, uh, breaking into certain networks. Um, those who are um, who are better uh, featured in Google search listings will tend to be listed further up. Will tend to be discovered quicker. Will tend to have more links put by other pages to them in ways that will further boost their status in the search listings. Um, this this process of preferential attachment is all around us. Um, those who have wealth will tend to be the ones contacted for new business opportunities and will tend to be you know, connected to new startups and be able to do very well through those startups, et cetera. Um, so there's a certain amount of processes that work through this feedback involving preferential attachment. Those who have tend to get more. Um, and we see this across many domains and it's associated with 
some real equity concerns that I'll be dealing with in a separate uh, talk later in this course, um, agent-based modeling and, and, and equity needs. Um, uh, because you know sometimes it can lead those from majority groups, for example, to be disproportionately featured, have disproportionate opportunities, disproportionately benefit, and the cycle continues. Um, so there's a reinforcing feedback loop. The more connections here an individual has, the quicker they accumulate additional connections. Um, and, and this gives rise to this scale-free structure that we're talking about. This gives rise to this sort of structure, gives rise to these network hubs. Um, and uh, that then induces the scale-free structure. So the term scale-free, I haven't yet explained. And I'm because of the limits of time, I'll, I'll go quickly through this explanation. But we're going to, for, for the sake of the explanation, we're going to call the number of connections a given agent has K, K, K for connections. Uh, and if we think of them as partners, we'll say the chance of having K partners is proportional to K to the minus gamma. Gamma is a, is some constant. Um, and remember, k to the minus gamma is the same as one over k to the gamma, right? Um, so what this means is, you know, uh, you will, as k goes up, uh, a smaller and smaller fraction of their connections will be to people with, well, uh, a, a, a smaller and smaller fraction of the population will have uh, that many connections. In other words, there will be some people maybe who have 10 connections, but most people, there'll be a lot more people who have five and a lot more people who have two connections. The more, the bigger the K is, the smaller and smaller the fraction of the population that will have that many connections. And people have, have shown in, in, in human networks, for example, human sexual networks, um, uh, K is, is between, uh, in the range of two to 3.5, I think it is. Um, you can look at empirical data here, um, data from a sort of number of sexual partners over time, you can plot it out and you can, you can actually identify gammas for scale-free networks for sexual connections tend to be between two and 3.5. Let's take, imagine that it was two. And so here we have the probability of having K partners is proportional to k to the minus two. So um, the likelihood of having two partners is proportional to one quarter. The likelihood of having three partners, so plug in three for k, um, uh, is, is proportional, actually, that should say to one ninth, not one eighth here, um, uh, and, uh, and, and so on. So uh, here, you know, uh, the probability of having five partners is proportional to one over 25. That's one over five to the, to the one over five to the two or five to the minus two. Um, and uh, this leads to uh, a, a scale-free situation. So if we have P of K, the probability of having K connections is proportional to K to the minus gamma. That means it's equal to some constant times k to the minus gamma. Um, so this is this is this feature, this power law feature, as we call it. It's power law because there's a, a fixed power here. Gamma is fixed. Again, for sexual networks for humans, it's between two and three point five. For the internet, there's some gamma for for the connections with servers, etc. So this is a power law connection. P of K equals some constant times K to the minus gamma. And if you just ask, okay, what if we don't have K? Suppose we have alpha times K number of connections. So we know what it is for K. What if we computed what it will be? What's the probability of having alpha times K connections? Maybe alpha is two, you know, having twice as many connections as K. Maybe alpha is three, having three times as many connections as K to figure out what fraction of the population have K alpha times K connections, we can plug in alpha K into this, uh, in this formula here, right? Um, this is the, number, the probability of having K connections. Probability of having alpha K is just C times plug in alpha K for K 
to, uh, to the minus gamma. And we can write this out. This is equal to C times alpha to the minus gamma times K to the minus gamma. And rearranging, what we get is it's alpha to the minus gamma times P of K. Now that may not seem that interesting, but I, I wanna try to motivate why that's so significant. Why it's so significant P of K turns up here again. So if we consider the probability of having K connections, that's this one, versus the probability of having alpha K connections, that's that one. We see that the ratio is always given by a constant. In other words, if you divide P of alpha K, probably of having, you know, uh, say, 200 connections compared to the probability of having 100 connections. So alpha is two here. Um, that's going to equal a, a constant. Alpha is a constant. Gamma is a constant. Um, alpha is two here. Uh, gamma is, is some value. If we asked um, what's the probability of having 20 connections compared to 10 connections, it's going to be the same constant. It doesn't matter. This constant here. This constant doesn't depend on K. So no matter if we're saying, what's the ratio of people with two connections versus one or 20 connections compared to 10 or 200 connections compared to 100 or 100 connections compared to 50 or 1,000 connections compared to 500, it's always going to be the same ratio. Um, it's the same ratio. Doubling. If we consider someone with a certain number of connections versus double the number of connections, they always have the same ratio between how common they are. Um, and we say that P of K looks the same at any scale. It doesn't matter how big K is. Um, how the probability of having K connections versus 2K is the ratio of those two is always the same. It's always the same. So this is why we call it scale free. It doesn't matter how big K is, the probability of having twice as many connections yet compared to the probability of having K connections is always the same. Um, and uh, this, this induces, if, if we think about it, and I'll, I'll come back to that earlier slide, um, this induces a, uh, a a pattern that we see in those log log plots that I first showed you. So if we have this, this relationship here, P of K equal is proportional to K to the minus gamma, which again, is just means it's equal to C times K to the minus gamma. If that's what we have um, here, then what it means is if we took the log on both sides, we'll just take the log of P of K on the left and if we take the log of this, uh, well, the log of C times K to the minus gamma, what is that? Well, you may remember when you take uh, the, the log of, of these things, I don't know why it says, um, uh, it, it, so if you have C times this, uh, uh, we're going to have log of C, right? Minus log of that. So if you have, log of A times B, you get log of A plus log of B. Um, and so, so here, the log of P of K is log of C minus, minus uh, gamma times the log of K. I don't know if you remember, but taking the log of K to the minus gamma will be gamma times log of K, right? Um, uh, and, what this is saying is if you plot out a log of P of K, instead of plotting out P of K, plot out a log of P of K, um, it's gonna be a linear function with a slope of gamma of log of K. Mm. So the probability of having K connections is going to, of having log K connections, uh, or sorry, the log of the probability of having K connections is going to be, a linear function of log of k. So let's let's go look at that. Um, uh, so it's going to look like well, like this. Um, uh, I, I included some other examples, but here's log of k on the x-axis, right? We have ten, a hundred, a thousand. Mm. So k is is, is, is ten or a hundred or a thousand, but we're plotting a log of k um, here. 
And we're plugging out log of P of K of, on the y-axis, the frequency. Mm. And what we see is that the, the frequency is a linear function of the log of the number of sexual partners. In other words, as, as we go up along this axis here, logarithmically, um, it'll pull down the, the log of this linearly. This is exactly an illustration of this relationship here. This is just is giving the offset. And as we go up log of K, that's the X axis, um, it'll be a slope of minus gamma downwards to give us log of P of K. So this slope is minus gamma minus gamma here. Um, the, the, the log of the probability of having K connections goes down linearly with the log of the number of connections. Um, so if we plot things out, we will see that sort of pattern. And we see this from empirical data. This is from some of our smartphone studies, like uh, contact durations and the probability of, of, of having those. This is actually the cumulative distribution there. Um, and you see it in same-sex partnerships as in many, many areas, um, many other areas. Um, okay, um, so uh, these, these patterns um, are replicated in many, many spheres. You'll see different gammas for different situations. Remember, gamma says, as the connections grow, how quickly does our probability of having the many connections drop? Right. Remember, remember this. As K grows, how quickly does our probability of having K connections drop? Um, if gamma is really, really large, it's like one over K to the gamma. Um, if gamma is really, really large, as K grows, P of K will will drop really quickly. Right. If this were K to the tenth, you know, it would drop really quickly as K grows compared to if gamma is is one. Um, in which case it's like one over a K. Um, uh, so, so here we have 3.3, .3. it comes down really quickly. Uh, uh, here, a uh, bit slower, uh, uh, and this is slower yet, et cetera. But the point is, in many, many cases, we see the scale-free behavior come out. We see it in all sorts of, of behavior, we see it in all sorts of structure in the world. Um, so scale-free networks, are of great concern uh, for many reasons. And one of them is that the dynamics in these networks mean that you, you cannot only consider the mean number of connections people have per unit time when considering them from a random mixing standpoint. You have to consider the variability in the number of connections. And it turns out that the, um, the variability, the, the variance in the number of connections people have is as important as the, the number of, of uh, connections they have on average in the population. Um, we don't have time to cover all that, but if you wanna characterize them with a random mixing model, you have to take into account variability because it's, it drives the situation. Okay, let's talk about though in our final comments here, Poisson random networks. So we've talked about um, local networks, um, ring lattice networks. We talked about distance networks in 2D space. Uh, we talked about um, uh, we talked about uh, networks which are scale free. Now we're going to be talking about Poisson random networks and. These go again by very many names, Erdos random networks, random networks, Bernoulli networks. Um, and the idea is simple. We, in contrast to those earlier types where we had tremendous structures, tremendous constraints imposed. Here we have minimal constraints. We have minimal structure. Any two pairs of nodes, A and B, any two people in this population are equally likely to be connected um, as any other. Um, there's no sense of who's nearby whom. There's no sense of who's a friend with whom and friends tend to have a lot of overlapping friends. No, 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 no. It's just any two people are equally likely to be connected. So let's go to main and let's go to network type and let's go to a random network. 
This is a Poisson random network. And once again, I don't know why um, we have this, um, it's, it's not changing the appropriate uh, connection here, but we're gonna change it to 10. Change it to 10, there we are. Um, okay, so um, I'm going to sort of go and, and refresh that and just make sure, oh my gosh. Okay, connections per agent should be 10. Um, here, 10. Okay. Um, so uh, we're gonna have a Poisson random network and it's gonna be 10 people per person on average. That's what we had for scale free. It's roughly what we had for 2D network. It's what we had for ring lattice network. And uh, we're going to maintain it here. So this is a random, randomly connected network. Any two people are equally likely to be connected. And it turns out that this is a very close analog to what we see in the random mixing um, situation for our, um, uh, our uh, aggregate model. So if we run this model, um, we will have people wired up here and it actually looks like it went uh, extinct there. Okay, that's that's very interesting. I think it's it's it by chance the first person who got it just didn't pass it on and uh, and it it went extinct. So I'm running it again, and now it starts to to spread, and it spreads all across that network. Can anyone tell me why does it spread all across that network? Anyone? Yeah, there's, there's, no, there's no sense of space. In the there's network. no sense of space. There's no structure on things. Two people are equally likely to be connected no matter who they are. Let's. I'm going to go to illustrate this better. You don't have to do this, but I'm going to go to main and make it a, a ring layout. Again, this won't affect the connectivity. I just want to show it visually, a ring layout here. Okay. So I went to main, went down to the space and network area and chose... Um, uh, a ring layout here. Okay, let's go try that. Go to baseline. Here we go. Um, and we will see in the baseline um, scenario with a thousand people. People are densely connected. This is black because there's so many connections. You notice that one person started connection, but why does it go way across the network? Anyone? Eric said it earlier. Why is this? So one person started infected, but it's already all across all across this ring. Why is that? Yeah, yeah, There's this is laid out in a ring. It's not ring connected. People are connected all across here. So that initial person would probably connect with this person, this person, this person, and this person, et cetera, all across here. And it's spreading, right? It's, it's spreading across the entire network. And it spreads throughout. There's no blocking, right? There's no blockage of the network because there's a trap, you know, there's a, a firewall of recovered or a firewall of already infected people. No, 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 no. So, so here's our random mixing model and here's our infective model. And you'll notice how similar they are actually. Um, we'll, we'll speed it up a little bit. They're not entirely similar. We saw the first time we did that, uh, it died out in the uh, the um, in the model with uh, the uh, the agent based model. It actually died out. But you'll notice that these two are almost they're bang on doppelgangers. I mean, they're bang on similar uh, in their overall features for most of the space. Now, then you'll notice it's going down to a very low level in the random mixing network, but it is rescued from extinction. Why do you think it's less, it's it's not going extinct here where the other ones did uh, early on go extinct so readily? Why is it that it that we haven't seen that extinction coming up quite as readily as we did for say a 2D local network? Anyone? Well, with the 2D network, things could get boxed in that that remaining set of infectives might be inaccessible to the remaining um to the remaining infectives but here it can spread all across the network and 
And so we, we see it survive actually, even with just population of a thousand uh, for quite a while. But what do you see in terms of the behavior kind of in steady state? Are they completely identical? Is the random mixing model the same as, as this model? How are they different? What do we see in the ABM model that we don't see in the random mixing, uh, the random, um, uh, the, the aggregate model, the, the sort of uh, high level stock and flow model? What do we see in the ABM? It seems to hit the same value, it just oscillates around it. It oscillates around it, and it oscillates around it in ways that are um, probably reflective of ongoing outbreaks. You can kind of see see these sort of um, people getting infected and, and, and recovering and so on. And there is um, variability where you might not expect it from the aggregate model, right? Um, there's variability about this mean. People are sending, you know, connected quite randomly, but there's still this variability. Um, and so we still have this chance of extinction we still have variability in this endemic situation. Um, and uh, that much is different. But in the initial phase, like in the aggregate model, you have this you know, uh, snowballing effect, this vicious cycle of the spread of infection early on. Then Marxism is almost identical in how the infection spreads. They are bang on similar here. Um, so that's a Poisson random network. Very similar in some ways to the aggregate model, but quantized, but um, it does have stochastics um, uh, and uh, therefore it's subject to extinction and subject to kind of this variability. Um, and uh, there additionally, those connections are fixed. Um, they're not to anyone at all. They're there to, um, uh, they're to some particular people. And, and that also imposes a little bit of additional structure that has some degree of implied resulting um, uh, sort of limitations in the, in the variability scene. I should have shown you this uh, connection uh, count. So this histogram, you'll notice for the population, the average is 10. But once again, we see considerable variability from about two up into the 20s. Okay. Um, so the final one, which we're going to look at here, um, is uh, a combination of both. It's a small world network. Okay. And for this, we will want to make use of that, uh, that setting whereby we lay it out in a ring lattice. So it's laid out. In, in a ring, I should say. It's not a ring lattice. We lay it out in a ring, okay? The layout type is a ring. And we're going to change the network type here to be a small world network, okay? And in this small world network, um, we're going to impose, and oh my gosh, um, uh, I think, Right. I believe that, in fact, we need to specify for the small world network a um, uh, connections per agent here. Um, my notes say to it's off by a factor of two, which would suggest five, but I'm going to leave it at 10 for right now and we'll come back to it. And we're going to have, we're going to have to specify one other parameter. So a small world network here comes in a variety of forms. These are, oops, um, for a small world network, uh, what characterizes them, actually how they're defined is that the distance, the number of hops between, on average, between two people in the population grows proportional to the log of the number of nodes. So if we have, um, we consider pairs of people in the population, we say, uh, how many hops does it take from to, to get from one to the other along the network. Um, and we have a population of um, size 100. Um, if we were to, to, to increase it to 1,000, um, we would have a number of hops that, that it takes to go from A to B. 
um, would, would in fact not be multiplied itself by a factor of a thousand. It might be one more hop on average, for example. So it goes with the log of this, not the actual number of, it's not proportional to the number of nodes. Um, doubling the network size leads to an increase of log of two uh, and the number of hops. Um, uh, you add log two to the number of hops, for example. The simplest uh, form of small, uh, of small world networks are what we're going to look at. Uh, they're a weighted combination of a ring lattice network with totally local connections connected with a certain number on left and right and a random network. So that's the Poisson random where we have global connections, where we don't pay at all attention to locality. So it's a weighted combination. It'll be like 90% ring lattice connected purely locally. I'm only connected with people nearby and 10% and random network, uh, which will be connected with people regardless of where they are. Um, and this neighbor link fraction dictates what fractions are in the, are, are to the local neighbors. So here we go. We're going to go back to this and it's a small world network connections per agent. I'm going to say 10 and neighbor link fraction 0.9. We're probably going to have to come back to this to say five. I don't know if Wade can utter anything on that. Okay, so let's go run baseline again for this. Um, and we're the first thing we're going to do is go look at this connections. Okay, yep, connection count is, is it's 10. Okay, so... This is what we're seeing. You, so we're going to have a network where most people, most of a person's connections are just with nearby people um, to the left and right of them. But 10% of their connections, that's one divided by 0.9, or sorry, one minus 0.9, right? So 10 per, 90 percent are with their local connections, 10%, the rest, 10% are with distant ones. And so this looks like a ball of yarn or something, right? Um, uh, this guy uh, got infected, but he's already recovered. So it's not going anywhere. Let's try running it another time here. Here we go. Um, and we're going to see, oh, um, this one also recovered before, before it spread. Okay, um, maybe thrice is the charm here. Uh, and, Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, also recovered too 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 early. Okay. Um, here we here we go. Okay. So it's spreading locally. You'll notice, but then suddenly something comes up here. Where did this one come from? It's spreading locally as it does in a ring lattice. But what happened over here? Can anyone say? Why why did it pop up over here? Yeah, one of these random connections. Remember, 90% of their connections are with their neighbors here along this ring lattice, along left and right. But 10% point somewhere else. And obviously one of these had a link over here because now it's spread over to there. And now it's spread here. And now it's spread here as well. And, and it's leaping across the networks. It's kind of like this is on fire and some embers drift over to a neighboring building and a neighboring building and a neighboring yard, and it starts to spread. So how close does this look to a ring lattice spread? Anyone? Yeah. It looks a lot like it is just, it can jump and kind of start the spread in a different area. It can, it can jump, that's right. So. Locally, it looks kind of like it. It can kind of spread, but it can leap to another area of the network. Um, and so it has this sort of combination of, um, if we compare it with the aggregate network, a combination of what you see with a Poisson random, where it's connected with, with this um, feature that you see with, uh, uh, with ring lattice, that it can only spread locally at a certain speed, um, and uh, and you know if you if if you go and you um, simulate it more, uh, chances are it will go extinct. If we were to run this a bunch of times, we would we would find that 
uh, you know, some of the time it goes extinct at first, uh, but when it does spread, it tends to spread then across this network uh, as well in ways that then make it hard to, to extinguish. So once it gets going across the network, it'll tend to spread and those will tend to spread eventually across the network. And in this case, it's only 10% like a Poisson random node. You only have 10% of the connections being global, but they're enough to cause a much bigger outbreak. And it, to, to take it out of this slow, 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 slow rise we saw with the purely ring lattice network. Um, we don't have time to go into it, but I'll just note that if you wanted to play with it, you might find, you know, how far do you have to can you take it? Could this be 95% of connections? Could it be 98 where you'd still see those, see it spread globally? Um, uh, it's an interesting question of, you know, um, that, that points to the fact it's nonlinear. It doesn't, it's not like, you know, it's 90% of the way to a, um, to a, to a uh, local ring lattice network and behavior. It still exhibits these, uh, uh, these outbreaks in a, large, in a notable set of uh, the circumstances. Okay, um, right. Um, I should note that that dying out at the very beginning is not specific to this network. It could occur for any network. Um, if we seed one person, there's a chance they may not spread it to others uh, before they recover. Um, that it's going to be pretty similar as long as they have similar numbers of connections. Um, okay. Um, so this actually should be removed now. It looks like that's been fixed in any logic here. Okay. Um, right. Um, yeah. Um, so I'll just remind you here that, um, so I, I did some derivations here. If anyone's interested in jumping into the derivation a little bit more closely on scale-free networks towards the end, but I want to remind you of um, you know our, my starting comments here that when it comes to representing networks, we've been we zeroed in here on this issue of the impact of networks on dynamics, and the impact of networks on dynamics is not merely one of degree; it can be a qualitative difference whether it survives or not, uh, whether it explodes uh, quickly or not, or whether it rises in a very linear way, a sort of slow way. Um, uh, but, you know, it, it's just one of a set of considerations here that motivate networks, and there's many others. There's the need to represent our interventions to capture the effects of the interventions across different groups within the population. There's a need to capture localized connections, um, uh, uh, perceptions of individuals within, within a network, and uh, to represent disparities different groups may have in access to resources like healthcare resources or uh, diagnosis resources, as a, as a particular example, or, or uh, reliable knowledge, health literacy, et cetera. So, so um, Networks have many roles to play in, in agent-based models, um, but one of their recurring um, important features is just how much they do modify the dynamics of the situation, not merely in degree, but sometimes often in qualitative ways. Um, so that's, that's all we have time for for now in the network sphere. And we're going to be going on and speaking about um, the role that space plays in these models, uh, space um, more abstractly, space geographically, um, both for situated agents, agents that are fixed in space, as well as mobile agents, agents that can move around in space. And we'll see that as we were, was hinted today, there's a relationship between networks on the one hand and space on the other. We saw in some cases how spatial layout of people could lead to, say, distance based networks um, uh, being induced. Um, and in general, when we have mobility between agents, that can induce network connections or make or break network connections. Um, so our knowledge on the network side will come in 
handy when we're talking about the impacts of space on, uh, on agent-based models. But uh, that will be starting Thursday um, in another two days. And before then, I'll be back to uh, quite a lot of you with respect to some specific uh, project-related recommendations or comments, et cetera. Uh, so thank you very much. And I will now close this session and open office hours.